Welcome to episode nine of the Triathlete Hour. I'm Kelly O'Mara, your host and the editor-in-chief of Triathlete Magazine. Today, I'm talking to Sarah Piampiano. The former Ironman champion gets super real with us about uncertainty, frustration, and adapting your goals. Plus, we talk about the challenges you face as a mature athlete who wants to start a family, how she's balancing all of that. But first, let's check in about the big Ironman news this week. Kona is officially postponed to February, meaning there will be two Ironman World Championships next year and two 70.3 World Championships. What will that be like? How will athletes train? And what other questions do you have? Be sure to subscribe to Triathlete wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss any new episodes or our new training podcast coming out later this week. Now, here's our show. Okay, I'm here with Jordan Blanco, who's been on our podcast before, but I came to you, Jordan, because you're kind of my Iron Man gossip, Iron Man insight person, and Iron Man had some big news this week. Um, yeah, hi, Kelly. It's good to chat again. Um, I'm not sure I like the gossip piece, but yeah, I definitely <laughs> follow what's going on in the Iron Man world as a, as a coach and a, a competitor myself. So yeah, the big news is that um, Iron Man uh, came out and postponed its two marquee races of the year both the Ironman World Championships in Hawaii that was scheduled for October, and then also the Ironman 70.3 World Championships scheduled for November in Taupo, New Zealand. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of people were expecting it, but now it's like official, right? So now officially Kona is moved to February 6th. So like 20, so Kona 2020 will be February 6th, 2021. And then 70.3 2020 worlds will be sometime in the spring they haven't decided yet and then in the fall we'll have them again we'll have the 2021 kona world championships and 70.3 that's a lot of racing in 2021 that's going to be kind of crazy yeah it potentially is but i mean i'm really pleased that they came out this early in may uh and made the postponement announcement it's been increasingly clear that the races are not happening anywhere in the world in june july and presumably through august too so that qualifying window for these two races was effectively disappearing. Um, and so it, it, I'm glad they came out early. I mean, I know there are some athletes already qualified for these races. Um, so they could potentially have gone ahead. But I mean, I don't think it would have been good for Ironman to have these championship races with a, um, a much smaller and less competitive field. So postponement was the right way to go. Yeah, I think I think there's a reason. You know, obviously, it makes sense. Um there were a bunch of questions people have, and I. this is why I was texting you when the announcement happened, because you have some athletes who have qualified. You qualified, but you turned down your slot. You were supposed to do uh, 70.3 in New Zealand. So my understanding right now is athletes who had already qualified and registered for Kona in October are going to be able to defer to the October 20, 2021 race if they want, but then anyone who qualifies from here on out it like varies race by race, but for the most part, like you're racing for a February slot. You can't pick and choose. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, so I think they've all the already qualified athletes are being offered the option of the February or October race. However, races that start up presumably in the fall, they will be designated as racing for February 2021 or October 2021. So those future qualifying athletes will not have the option. They, when they uh, sign up for a race, let's say, for example, it's the St. George um, Ironman that's um, slated for September, that will have slots for February 2021. Right, and it says um, it on the calendar, guys. Like, don't stress out. You know which one, you know how many slots. Um, Ironman's been updating that kind of as things come. Like this past weekend, I think they canceled Lake Placid and... Ironman Canada, and so those both got up, you know, they're updated. Obviously, this is all changing all the time, yeah. like constantly. And I, and I think that brings up an important point too, Kelly, that even though Ironman has planted the stake in the ground for the February 6th, 2021 date, there's still so much movement around the world, even whether races can go ahead, whether you can have mass participation events, even whether people have access to training. Um, some pools are opening up around the world, but I don't expect my pool here in San Francisco to be open anytime in the next two months. So 
things are still fluid. I like that they put a stake in the ground, but it, I think it's still a chance that that February date does not go ahead. Oh, for sure. That's um, definitely a question I think a lot of people are having. Uh, what I've been hearing from people in Hawaii, too, you know, it is certainly... They're like, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to be ready for this in February. Um, but I think at this point, at least most of the pros are saying, you know, you kind of have to plan on it. You kind of have to plan. February is now your date. Move forward. Change your goals. Adjust. Let's go. Yeah. For professional athletes, it's, uh, I mean, they've got to be excited that, well, not excited that race has been postponed, but excited to have a, kind of like I said, stake in the ground and a date. Um for them, it's they've lost a lot of opportunities to make money. So at least kind of having something to start working towards versus like nothing on the calendar. I think one of the challenges will be the idea of having compressing two seasons into a single season in 2021 with the evacuation of races this year. Suddenly, you'll be asking professional athletes to qualify late fall this year for an early uh, or late winter February 2021 race, recover from Ironman Hawaii, qualify again, and then race Ironman Hawaii. I mean, that's a very, very hard race. And so asking people to be in peak fitness two times in a year, as well as like layering in the qualifying process, that's a, a very big ask. Yeah, because I think most people, or not most people, but obviously a lot of people do kind of a peak in the spring, qualify, recover, and then race in the fall. And so now if you have to do that like up and down, up and down, it does raise some questions on if, you know, everyone if everyone's going to do both the February and the October race, or if one of the races will be a little bit weaker, a little bit lighter, you know, people will pick to focus on one or the other. I'm not sure yet. Yeah. And I think it's going to be hard. Like, as I, as I just mentioned, like they haven't raced at all this year. I mean, people are going to be ex competitive athletes, certainly on the pro side, and they're going to be anxious to get back on the starting line to test their fitness um, evaluate what weaknesses they worked on in this like, <laughs> COVID-19 training environment, um, but also just earn a paycheck. Um, so there'll be some economic pressure. And that economic pressure not necessarily just extends to the pro athletes, but also to the sponsors. Like there's potentially a lot of the sponsors have struggled with like not selling race kits, not as new bike, many like competitive race bike sales and other things this year. And suddenly like they'll have, two events next year that they need to sponsor um, for each of the Ironman and 70.3 distance, it could be a lot of pressure um, financially all around. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine how they're all going to do I'm already stressed about trying to cover two Konas and an Olympics and two 70.3 Worlds in one year. It sounds very stressful. So I don't can't imagine trying to race all of them. Yeah, and I, I, I guess you did touch on the 70.3 Worlds and that a new date has not yet been set um, for that race. I do understand there are talks about um, kind of late February, early March in New Zealand. But um, again, like so much really depends on what happens with the country and borders being open and, and having international access to, to really um, be able to for that race to happen, at least in New Zealand. So. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people point out these are both islands. Like New Zealand has very strictly controlled access to the island. And because of that has controlled the virus. Same with Hawaii. Even right now, it's like a two week quarantine if you come into Hawaii. Um, so these are islands. It's not just it, 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 which comes with a whole different set of rules and regulations and all that. So, yeah, and I was fortunate to chat with some friends who live on the big island last night. And they're in a real quandary. The economic dependence on tourism of that island is massive and the island's really struggling and yet they realize that if they do open up the island back to visitors um it would put an immense strain on their healthcare resources so they're in a quandary like much as many of our of us are around the world these days yeah it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of you know what happens from here obviously this does have precedent 1982 there was a february and an october ironman world championships so that's you know. true. Um, and then uh, the other question that I, a few people have mentioned is what are the conditions in Hawaii like in February relative to October? Um, I have managed to be able to head out there um, for training weekends in February in past years. And my experience is the, the temperature is a little cooler, but it's still very much Hawaii. So it's still hot, still humid. Um, the ocean swells can be a little larger earlier in the year. And the winds can be unpredictable, but I think I could say that about Hawaii every, every week <laughs> right. of the year. So 
I don't know if that's valuable insight or not. Right. You're like, great, great insight there. I think the other thing, obviously, <laughs> if we're getting really in the weeds of, you know, what age group athletes are worried about with this February race is training over the winter. That's kind of what no one really knows what that's going to look like, especially for, our, you know, Northern Hemisphere athletes. Like, it's a lot of trainer time to then go race on an island in hot, humid conditions in the wind. It is. Really but then you have you have the Australians, the South Africans, and the Kiwis licking their lips. But like, <laughs> finally, they get to to race in their summertime. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. One athlete that I do coach that um, was planning to race a uh, Hawaii October twenty twenty does not mind the February twenty twenty one day, even though she lives in northern Montana and trains her indoors. She's just excited to go. She's been like, planning on this for like multiple years to, to get there. So um, she's like, whenever the race happens, I want to be there. So I'll, like, I'll be there. Sign me up. Um, and I haven't heard yet what they're doing with the legacy athletes either. So, you know, there are definitely people who are excited about, about it. I think it'll be interesting. Hopefully, hopefully it happens, right? Hopefully some of these races now next year, we actually can, can all get together again and do them. I, it will be a very good day when we can finally be confident that a race is going to happen. I know I'd be very excited about that. <laughs> well, thanks for chatting with us, Jordan. And thanks for all your, you know, Iron Man insight. Hi, guys. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. We have an exciting new podcast coming all about training later this week called Triathletes Fitter and Faster. It'll be dedicated to all the training topics you care about to help you get fitter and faster. Subscribe to Triathlete Magazine's feed so you don't miss this first episode with Dr. Stacey Sims or any other future episodes. Now, here's our conversation with Sarah Piampiano. All right, I want to welcome Sarah Piampiano, who is the third fastest, has the third fastest in history Ironman time from Ironman Brazil last year, you know, winner of many Ironmans. Uh, well, so thank you, Sarah, for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always, uh, it's always great to be on and I appreciate triathlete continuing to do great coverage of the space. Yeah, continuing to cover triathlon, even though there aren't any triathlons right now. <laughs> <laughs> In the non-existent triathlon world, yes. yes. So <laughs> I feel like I should say, so we used to live really close to each other. I would see you like all the time uh, mm -hmm. at the pool, on bike rides in Marin County. And Marin is yeah. like, if people don't know, it's across from San Francisco. We have a lot of good athletes, a lot of like Olympians. So many good athletes. Yeah. So I know. It's actually crazy. Well, I was going to say, it's I know you've of... been trying to get some KOMs, right? Lately? Yeah. I have been. Yeah. And, and I was going to say like, it's actually crazy. Cause I think I don't ever see any of the athletes that live around here ever. Really? Like I never see Allison Tedrick. I never see Kate Courtney. Like I there's, I mean, there's just so many amazing and ultra runners and all these people. And now because we're all in the same place and we can't travel, I've been seeing everybody everywhere, which is quite funny, but, oh, um, okay. Yeah. But, but, uh, yeah, I've been definitely trying to go after some of the QOMs and I've gotten a couple, but the big ones that I really want to get, which are um, Bofax, which is like a three and a half mile climb and Mount Diablo, which is an hour, God, 50 minutes. It's a, it's, a, it's a 10 mile climb yeah. an hour. Yeah. Um, I haven't gotten those yet, but I'm Bofax, I'm pretty close to the top, but uh, Diablo, I've got to go back and give it another try. Try it again. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I saw you were trying to do all these KOM, QOM hunting things because everyone's trying to come up with new goals. And I was like, that's a tough place to go after them. You have to beat like some very fast people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely, I got so excited actually because I, I think we're all sort of searching for a goal to have right now. And I, my coach sort of what one day said, why don't you go for this QM attempt? So I went for it and I got so excited about actually having a goal that I started going for all these different QM attempts. And every time I'd ride a hill, I'd be like, just totally going after it. And I kind of dug myself into a little bit of a hole. <laughs> so <laughs> going after QMs. So I had to take a step back and I'm kind of recovering a little bit right now. And I, I'm going to do some more QM attempts in the next couple of weeks, but I've had to, I've had to recover from my QM attempts. I think, I think that's a problem. Like we did a little guide to like, if you want to go KOM hunting and one of the tips was like, don't overdo it. Like you could overdo yeah. it. <laughs> I totally overdid it. Totally. So talk to me then a little bit about, you know, this time, this, I, I never know what to say about, we, we keep calling it this thing. 
Um, and how you're adapting, what you're doing, you're stuck at home. How have you been changing your training? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, everybody's kind of like going through their own process and own evolution. I think when it first hit, my initial inclination was actually just to take a complete step back, not to essentially remove all intensity from my training and really just kind of do more of like an endurance focus block because my, I didn't realize it was going to go on for as long as it has. I don't think anybody realized that. And my view was, this is probably going to be the opportunity that we have to take kind of this mental mid season break. And the back half of the year is going to be filled with tons of racing. It's going to be really intense and stressful. So I just don't want to um, be taking on a full training load right now and adding in a whole bunch of intensity. And so we did that for a while, but then when it became clear that it was going to go on for a little bit longer, we started adding in more intensity um, into my training, but in a, in a more fun and a little bit less structured way. So, you know, normally where I will go out and have specific intervals, I'm not really doing much of that right now. A lot of my intensity is coming from doing these QOM attempts or maybe doing some Zwift races, or I just did the Ironman VR seven race this past weekend. Um, so to ha trying to have a little bit of fun with it, which is giving me a continued sort of like mental break, um, not being totally focused, but, um, for me, definitely having some goals in mind is important. Um, and so I think that that's been an important part of kind of navigating this process. So you've been like I, adjusting your goals or kind of like changing them as you go or I have been. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, from a training perspective, like I said, originally I thought, okay, I'm just gonna, I need to make sure that I'm mentally fresh and physically fresh when things start up again. And now realizing that it's going to be a lot longer than anticipated, you know, we brought back some intensity, but actually I just even had a, a call with my coach yesterday where I said, I want to come up with some specific um, goals and things to focus on. And it doesn't, they don't have to be, you know, watts or paces or anything like that. But if it's, if there's something within the bike that I need to be working on, like let's set a goal and focus in that. If there's something in the run that I want to be working on, let's focus on that. So I just am trying to come up with a few, um, <clears throat> just, th just targets that I can work towards whatever those may be. Um, so I think it's an evolving process. And, and I think that for example, last week with the announcement that Kona has been postponed until February yeah. for us that I think, created a big shift in what our focus looks like because now rather than continuing to try to work towards October um, or at least be in a position where if we if things open up we would you know be able to get back into some sort of race fitness pretty quickly I think that that's that focus has shifted a bit um, knowing that Kona's not gonna happen this year yeah I mean I have a couple questions. So uh, first off, I've seen you on Instagram posting that you did like back to back hundred mile rides. And I was like, <laughs> why, Sarah? Why? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, see, so here's the thing is I really like to dig myself into a hole. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my favorite thing to do. <laughs> and I get real. I, I love doing long, big stuff. And so, in fact, after I did those 200 mile rides, I went back to my coach and said, I think we should just try to re-simulate the Tour de France and I should go on this huge epic ride journey for three weeks and he just pretty much responded no <laughs> he just like ignored that email like no. <laughs> no no um so I love that stuff so for me doing two 100 mile rides back to back is actually fun okay, okay. um but then I do have to remind myself to take a step back and, and allow myself to recover to me, to me, it's that, that is actually not so much like a training focus thing and more just like, let me go out on an adventure and do something really fun. I get that. I actually have been doing something so, like to, having the same, like, I want to just go on a long bike ride. But then with the quarantine, I've also been like, I've been having to bring everything with me. It gets yeah. very intense when you're like camel back. Very and, yeah. <laughs> it's very intense. Like my, my pockets are just like bulging with like all of my nutrition. Cause usually like on a long ride, I'll stop halfway and eat like a bag right. of potato chips or do something. And now pretty much everything i've definitely done a couple hundred mile rides on like three bottles of water which yeah i did that too the best thing to no do. stopping i don't want to like stop anywhere i don't want to like contribute to spreading anything yeah. <laughs> so but okay we were also talking before though about kind of adjusting your mindset before we started recording with this notion of 
because I've been clinging a little bit to the idea of races happening in the fall. And now I'm trying to like, you know, if it happens, great, but I'm OK if it doesn't. How have you been dealing with like adjusting? Do you think they're going to happen? Or do you have like a date circled? Or are you just kind of like, look, it'll be a win if they do, but I'm not worried about it. That's definitely the mindset I'm taking. I think um, I was certainly looking towards Kona. I'm anxious to see what would happen there. But I'm of the opinion personally that I don't really foresee any mass participation races happening in 2020. Um, And even potentially at the beginning of 2021, I have absolutely no basis for that other than I just (laughs) feel like (laughs) – you know, just seeing how things are progressing and the expectation that there's probably going to be another surge at some point, maybe in the fall. I, and, you know, the vaccine probably isn't going to come out until sometime next year. I just don't anticipate that there's going to be an environment where, you know, the CDC or government agencies are going to be supporting mass participation races. And so my whole mindset has just been, all right, I'm just going to focus on the things that I can focus on. I can still make a ton of progress and and do things that are really productive for um, my training and, and work on some weaknesses. And it certainly is an opportunity. It's almost like being injured. If you like can't run, then maybe you, you focus on your biking or, you know, if you can't bike and run, maybe focus on your swimming. I think there's definitely a big opportunity right now for all of us to be focusing on a lot of weaknesses. Um, and if things open up and races happen, it's just going to be a cherry on top. But I'm not sitting here, even with the newly rescheduled date for Kona, I'm not sitting here gunning for February 2021. I think that we're not going to know a lot until the end of the year. And I'm just I'm just making the assumption it's not going to happen. And if it does, great. Because it's just like better to be plan for the worst. Or what is it? It's prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Like that's the... Sort of. And I, and I feel like if we're just constantly holding on to these races that may or may not happen, it's, I think it's actually bringing this like level of either anxiety or stress that's completely unnecessary versus if I, for myself, I feel like if I've just sort of like accepted the situation that I'm finding myself in, which granted isn't as bad as other people, like I can still get outside and ride and I can swim in the bay and I can run and things like that. Um, but you know, just accepting the situation I find myself in is better and I think a little bit more relaxing um, and probably more productive than just constantly feeling disappointed that things aren't aren't moving forward. Right. Makes sense. Part of the reason I had emailed you last week and wanted to talk to you this week was you did a podcast with Wits Up a week or so ago mm-hmm. about kind of dealing with this anxiety and this uncertainty and this disappointment, particularly I don't want to, as a mature athlete, let's say. (laughs) I am. I am am a mature athlete. (laughs) And like trying to balance the idea that you like want to start planning a family, want to start having a family, but you might only have so many years of racing left. Like, and it was just, it was refreshing to hear a pro talk like openly about a lot of that. I mean, I feel like we don't hear that a lot from, you know, the professional athletes. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um. So for people who don't know, I'm turning 40 this year. My husband and I want to start a family. It was my expectation um, and what I've communicated to all my sponsors. So it's, you know, nothing that they're not hearing, but this was. <laughs> right, this surprise. isn't like. A- <laughs> <laughs> um, but this was 2020 was expected to be my last year of racing or that was the, that was the approach I was taking. And then we were going to try to start a family and with everything that, has been going on with COVID, it just has been pretty stressful for me in the sense that I, I have actually been like, on one hand, I'm definitely not expecting races to happen. But then on the other hand, I have felt like, well, maybe if they do, I don't know. And with it, with 2020 technically or theoretically going to be my last year, I, I was sort of holding out hope that that, that that was going to happen. Um, that there were going to be some races and I could get, get some races in. I'm qualified for Kona already, but um, we definitely are trying to move forward with starting a family. And um, I think that the plan at this point, because things are continuing just to get pushed off. And now with Kona definitely not being in 2020, we definitely are, are hoping that maybe that something like that can happen. And then I would try to come back and race in 2021. 
So this at least offered a little bit of certainty. So now, like, because like before you were kind of like, should I just try and have a kid this year and then come back? Or should I like wait or like, because you don't know. Yeah. And I mean, that's what I was feeling. You know, my, my general feeling was, you know, what do I do at this point? Because Kona was going to be sort of like the last big hurrah. And like, maybe I might race, maybe I might race again after that, but that was going to be it. And I don't want to lose that opportunity to have that. Um, I don't want to miss out on races. I feel an obligation to my sponsors, you know, they're supporting me. I want to make sure I'm supporting them. There's just kind of like, certainly a lot of stress around that for me. And I think honestly, there's probably a lot of female pro athletes out there that are have feeling exactly the same thing right now. I think right now it seems like the absolute perfect opportunity to start a family or have a kid. If that's something that you're interested in, I mean, we're all in the same situation. Nobody is racing. It's like, this perfect break and time to do it. But then I think everybody's like, what's going to happen? Is racing going to come back? Is it not? Like they don't want to miss out either. And I think um, definitely with Kona, the announcement of Kona being delayed to me, that just like gave me the, the certainty that I needed to kind of move forward with what we want to do. Yeah, the um, oh, I can never pronounce her name right. Alphen, Alphen, the woman who won the marathon trials was saying she also was hoping to have the Olympics this summer and then have a baby. And now she's like, do I wait? I don't know if I wait. Like, oh, it's yeah. stressful. And it's hard. And and actually, particularly for me, being a mature athlete. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I, there's there are plenty of female athletes who are younger who, if they have a child or don't have a child right now, it's not the end of the world, but I'm at this point in terms of my age where, and this is one of the things I talked about on what's up is like, I still love what I do. Like I love competing as a triathlete. I still feel like there's more in me. I don't, I feel like I'm just sort of like hitting my stride in some aspects with respect to my performances. And so I feel this frustration of the pressure around my age. And I'm essentially in this period where it's necessary for if we want to have kids and we don't plan on adopting, it's necessary for me to start having children right now. And I feel really frustrated by that, but I'm trying to view the COVID thing as an opportunity maybe to have a kid and not really miss any time. Um, <laughs> You're like, it's so. the upside, right? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. The upside of COVID. <laughs> I'm not missing out. <laughs> yeah, I could see that being frustrating. I mean, have you talked? Obviously, there are a lot of, or not a lot, but triathlon has had a rash of of women, you know, have a kid and come back really strong. You have like Rachel, you have Meredith, you have Carolyn. Um, Radka and Rini. Yeah, and it was like so many. I, <laughs> I guess so it's many. crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. And yeah, and I, I find that incredibly inspiring, actually. Like, I think what those women, the present those women have set, because before this most recent wave of triathlon babies, you didn't, you might see a female here or there having a baby and coming back, but mostly not. Mostly you just see someone who, a female pro triathlete and they'd have a baby and then that would be the end of their career. And I, it's been really inspiring to see these women um, doing what they're doing and, and truly coming back stronger. I mean, I feel like Radka, for example, is way stronger than she was, you know, oh, pre-baby. Yeah. It's incredible. And, um, you know, it's, it's just been amazing to watch these women, but I think the, the feeling like it scares me actually to have a baby and think about trying to train and race at my best and also be the mother that I want to be. And that's the thing that, that makes me really nervous. And I also, I think I'm going into, um, becoming a mother with the expectation that like, maybe I won't want to come back. Like, I think that you can't, I was really impressed that Michelle Vesterby when she was pregnant said, Oh, I'm definitely coming back. This is definitely what I'm going to do. Like I'm on the comeback trail and granted she was like training 30 hours a week when she was pregnant, <laughs> right. which was like mind blowing to me. But, um, you know, I guess I'm going in not really knowing if I'm going to want to come back or not. Although I will say through all of this anxiety and everything around COVID, I, and now with the announcement of Kona being postponed, I do feel like I would like to try to have a kid and then come back and at least close out my career. Right. Like I feel really unsettled with, with my, the end of my career and I want to have the opportunity to close it out. So someone told me you're supposed to retire when you feel like you did everything that you could have done, even if you don't win, right. That you did, you're not supposed to retire when you feel like, Oh, you had something left. Cause then you're just always going to 
This is what I was told. I'm not saying I know. I don't know. Like, I just feel like I need to retire on my terms. Right. That's right. And I, and I, my general feeling is that unless you're somebody like Daniela or Chrissy Wellington or, you know, these people who have achieved such like next level of success, I imagine most of us are going to walk away from our careers feeling like we didn't achieve everything you everything wanted. that we right. wanted to. Like, I don't think that we're ever going to be fully satisfied, but I also think that, you know, when it's time to, to end. And actually, I mean, Kelly, I'm, you and I have had this conversation. <laughs> We've had a lot of like post-race, should we quit? Should we not yeah. quit? Conversation. I, I went through a period um, in 2018 where I was like so burned out and I was, wasn't really enjoying it. And I would go to the races and it wasn't fun. And I was like actually quite miserable because I felt like, should I retire? But I don't want to retire, like hating the sport so much. And I'm really unhappy. And I, I, is this really the end? Is this what it's going to be like? Right. And then thankfully I like took this big break and I came back and had a lot of success last year and sort of like refound the love of triathlon. But I think, um, I think it's hard. I think it's hard to know when, when to be done, but I think you do know. And, and again, I feel like you, you're never really going to end your career feeling like you accomplished everything you wanted to. Probably even Daniela thinks like she could have won that one last year. And, you know, like everybody thinks that. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I, I mean, even Danielle or even Jan, I mean, I think that it, I think as professional athletes where we're like constantly trying to reach the next step, I don't think we ever get satisfied. Like last year in Brazil, I had this like totally total career day that was like blew my mind. Like, I never even expected anything like that from myself to be totally honest. And then I like basked in the glow of the success for like a week. And then I immediately raised my bar to like the next level, you know? Right. And I was like, all right, I just ran a 253 or 252. I don't even remember what I ran. Now I'm going to run under 250. And like every other run race I had after that was like a total disappointment <laughs> <laughs> because I like wasn't running under 250. So I think we're just like always raising the bar. Right, right. And you talked about, okay, so 2018, when you kind of went through the slump and you felt like really discouraged and wanted to quit, I know you took a long amount of time off that year. Like you took like four or five months off and that kind of helped you reinvigorate. And by off, we mean like off. Off. Yeah. <laughs> Not like pro athlete when they say they're off and they're really training 20 hours a week. Yeah. Right. Oh, it was off. I was, I was off, off for about, uh, eight weeks, so almost two months. And then I was training about eight to 10 hours a week for like another three months. Um, and I just, I just, the fire wasn't there, you know, like I wasn't excited to be, and I, I wasn't excited to be getting up and training and I certainly wasn't excited to be racing. And, um, honestly, I just think that I had, I needed a big break. And then, and I've said this before, but it was like a light switch. Like I literally, I remember waking up, I was in Arizona. I went out for, I was, I had a long ride and I got on my bike and I was like, I'm back. Like, this is it. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> I'm happy again. I'm ready to go. Like, I don't even know what it was. It was like literally an overnight thing where the day before I'd had like one of the worst, I couldn't even do my workout. It was so bad. And then the next day I woke up and it was like, I was ready to go. So I think, I think honestly, it was just this, I just needed a big break and I needed time to mentally relax and physically relax and just allow my body to kind of heal a little bit. Okay. And I know when you came back, another big aspect has been, um, so you're trained by Matt Dixon and there used to be more of a squad and then like a lot of people left. And, and now you have Chelsea Sadara to train with again. And that, I think you two are always out together all the time. And I think that's also helped, right? Like having a partner. For sure. Um, I, having Chelsea join was amazing because, you know, she has, she's young. She's well, compared to me, the mature <laughs> athlete. <laughs> yeah. She's young. She just turned 30. Um, but she just has this, she's new to the sport. She's got this fire and excitement and desire to learn and push herself and improve. And having her show up every day and bring that to the sessions is really exciting and inspiring for me. She's, as many of us know, is an incredible runner. She comes from, she was a professional runner prior to becoming a triathlete. And um, running is also my strength, but I'm not as strong of a runner as she is. So she's really pushed me in that aspect. And it's just been, and I'm, you know, have been a stronger cyclist than her. And so I've been able to 
push her on the bike and we just complement each other really well. And it's fun to be able to show up at practice every day and have sort of like quite a bit of motivation through this dynamic that we have. I know like, I'm trying to think of the nice way to say this, but you know how like a lot of times women have a bad reputation for training together and it can be kind of tense or, but in reality, I don't know if I've ever experienced that. How do you feel like you balance that? Like you're competitors, but you're also training and it can be, a little tense sometimes, but then you still have to help each other. Have you ever found that tricky? Um, occasionally for sure. I mean, I think that we are competitors and we do both want to beat one another. Um, I think that certainly one of the advantages is that we, I think we both recognize each other's strengths and weaknesses. And so like we're running as she's certainly a stronger runner than I am. Like, I don't necessarily expect to beat her in running, but like she's a, we're able to support one another that way. And like, same thing with cycling, like, you know, there, we definitely have different strengths and weaknesses on the bike. And so at the times when we're doing sessions that aren't to my strengths, you know, usually she's stronger there and we're able to push one another and vice versa. So, but yeah, I mean, I think there's moments when each of us gets kind of pissed off that <laughs> the other person's beating them. Like we, neither one of us wants to get, get beaten, but um, at the end of the day, and we've talked about this a lot, which is I have a lot of male training partners and I love training with them. I love having them push me. Um, it's a huge advantage having, having great, great training partners, but those aren't the people that I'm racing against. So it actually like matters very, very little how I stack up against these, these other guys right. versus with Chelsea, literally if. Chelsea throws the hammer down and like absolutely smashes me one day. Like that's the standard, right? Like that's the person I'm lining up against. So if that's what Chelsea's doing, I have to be able to do that too. So I don't, I like put this pressure on myself to step up to the next level because that is literally, that's the standard and vice versa. Like if I go out and perform really well, you know, on a bike session and I smash her, like that's the standard and she knows she needs to elevate her game. So actually knowing that, that's the person that you're racing against, I think makes a big difference in terms of how um, we're able to push each other and not letting ourselves off the hook in terms of like, if you're just training with another guy and they smash you, you're like, Oh, well they're a guy and they're really strong. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But if like, there's your competitor and she's like killing you, you're like, (laughs) 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 yeah, I'm still not sure if we're allowed to swear on the podcast or not. (laughs) Yeah. I know. (laughs) It's like bleep. <laughs> Do you think? I mean, that kind of brings up an interesting point. Um, because we joked earlier, you and I have talked after some bad races. There, do you yeah. think there is a camaraderie among the women in the pro field? Like, do they support each other? Or it does it, it does it vary like person to person? I think it varies, probably. I think it varies. I definitely think it varies. I think. I think it comes a little bit with age and experience of the athlete. And I also think there's just like a confidence factor that comes in. Um, you know, I think that some people are super, super supportive and other people are a little bit less. So like, I think some people haven't like kind of mastered how to like channel their competitive drive and still be supportive to the other females around them. But, um, I think that we're moving in a really good direction is what I would say. I definitely think that what you see in terms of people, women supporting women, is is improving from what I personally saw when I first started racing triathlon professionally. When did you start? I feel like we should tell your your origin story here because it is a little crazy. It always is surprising to me that this story like didn't get picked up more. Do you want to tell it? Go ahead. I I did my first triathlon in 2009, but I was living in New York City. I was an investment banker doing M&A. I was working uh, very long hours usually well over a hundred hour weeks, which seems crazy, but that's what it was. And I was also smoking, um, (laughs) multiple packs of cigarettes a day, not every day, but like I usually smoked one to two packs of cigarettes a day. It seems reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, you know, when I go in, I go all in on whatever (laughs) it is I'm doing. So (laughs) I was that way with smoking too. Um, and ended up signing up for a triathlon with a friend that I went to school with. And we went and did the race. And I, growing up, I had been a competitive uh, uh, runner and ski racer. And so I had this 
athletic background and I went to the triathlon and I did it and I pretty much fell in love with it instantaneously. I stopped smoking on the spot, sort of, um, and got, (laughs) for the most part, I would like smoke a cigarette here and there for a little while, but, um, and then went home, bought a bike, called Matt Dixon, begged him to coach me and, uh, you're like I did one triathlon I think I could be good at this (laughs) pretty much what happened I I, technically I did two like I did that first one I went and bought a bike afterwards and then I actually trained for the second race and I ended up going and winning the second race and at that point in this little local triathlon I decided that I was down for the Olympic Games and (laughs) I was gonna be really good so and he pretty much rejected you at first right he did. Yeah. yeah. He said, thanks, but no thanks. Um, and then I, I happened to be out in San Francisco, uh, for a business trip. And so I reached out to him and I said, do you have 30 minutes to have a coffee? And he's like, I have 15 minutes. And I was like, okay. And I went and met him and we ended up talking for like an hour. And at the end of the hour, he said he would coach me. And he's, he's literally like, he's the only coach I've had. Oh, that's impressive. Cause I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of people, you like reach the a plateau often and change coaches. It's like pretty common. Yeah. And it's an interesting thing. Like, I mean, I, I don't even think I've told this to Matt, but I, I, you know, I've definitely gone through phases where it's hard when you are wanting to see this progression as an athlete. And then you look around and you see, Oh, so-and-so changed coaches and look how they're suddenly doing now. Or, you know, these coaches are spitting out like this person really improved their swim. But I, then always reflect back on one kind of how well Matt knows me as an athlete and a person to not just, it's not just Matt, but it's actually the support team that surrounds me in terms of my strength coach and nutritionist and massage therapist. And it's this whole community that exists around me. So if I were to change coaches like that probably would shift as well. Um, And then where I have plateaued, I have, actually always had really amazing communication with Matt. Like the, in 2018, I went to Matt and I was like, I think I want to quit triathlon. I'm so burned out. <laughs> like, and I just thought he'd say, yeah, you're washed up and dried out. Like you're like, done. Luck, and he's right. like, yeah, good luck. And he's like, no, you know, rather than training 35 hours a week, we need to totally shift things around. And I think you need to do this and this and this. And like, you need to take a big break. And he was able to evolve with me and what my needs were as an athlete. And for me, that's been the most important thing. Like he hasn't just stuck with one philosophy about what training plan has going to, is going to be the best for me. Like he has been willing to move with me as an athlete as I've progressed, which has been really great. So you've been doing, so you went pro about 10 years ago and I mean, you, well, I guess you didn't go pro right away. You started with Matt, you had a year or two, then you went pro And did you see like results right away or did it take a while? I feel like it took a little while. Yeah. Well, so I had this like crazy thing happen where in my second race as a pro, I showed up at New Orleans 70.3 and it was like a totally stacked field. Rennie was there and Heather Wartell was there and Caitlin Snow was there and Amy Marsh was there. And I don't know, it was just like, all of these athletes that I was just like, Oh my God, the swim got canceled. So they did a run bike run and I won. (laughs) (laughs) No idea how that happened, but I won. And so that was, I had this like immediate success in my second race. But then I think that that was just an anomaly. Like I honestly don't even know how that happened, but it did. But after that, I, it was just chipping away bit by bit. Like I feel like every year it's, my bike has gotten a little bit better, but my run hasn't. And then the next year my run's gotten a little bit better, but my bike hasn't, you know, I just feel like it's been the only thing that hasn't gotten better is my swim, (laughs) but, (laughs) but just chipping away. And I think that that honestly is just years upon years upon years of training. It's just the layering and building the resilience and stuff. And I actually feel like last year, finally, for the first time, I felt like I started racing up to what my potential was. I think that's something that so many of us kind of struggle with. Mm -hmm. None of us ever feel like we're racing up to our potential. No. Ever. No. (laughs) Um, 
and then I think we always wonder, I think it's a really, I feel like we often all always walk away from every race feeling disappointed because you never, like some part of your race might go well, but you, it's like so rare that everything comes together. So rare that you're able to see the kind of performance in a race that you think that you're able to execute on based off what you're seeing in training. And I don't know, then you wonder if it's ever going to happen type of thing, but it does. <laughs> I, know, I was joking. All triathletes are like eternal optimists, right? We all hope that this one's going to be the one that works out. <laughs> yeah. I know. The funny thing is, is I think I'd like given up hope that that was going to happen. And then I went to Brazil last year and I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> it was crazy. I was not expecting that. <laughs> Um, so obviously like can't make any plans right now. No idea what's happening this year. Are you just kind of going with it? It does sound like you're close to thinking about retiring though. What would you do after? Would you go back to wall street? Would you stay in triathlon? What happens next? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in the process, uh, of trying to think through that. Um, I, I'm, I'm struggling with it to be honest. I think, um, I, don't think that I'm interested in going back into finance, although I don't want to totally limit myself. Um, but certainly having effectively been in business for myself for the last 10 years and not being in a corporate environment where I'm having to go an office to an office every day is something that I've really embraced and enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the idea of going back into an office is something that I, that I'm struggling with, you know, like I think probably most athletes struggle with it because you know, we're outside or in some capacity training all day. And then suddenly you have to go sit behind a desk and behind a computer. It's, I don't know, it's hard to, and then, and then you're not managing your own hours. It's hard to sort of accept. So I've been um, d dabbling with a few ideas around starting my own business. Okay. Um, and I would like to try to combine maybe my background in finance with sort of the health and wellness platform that I feel like I've, gained and learned from over the course of the last 10 years being a triathlete. Um, so I've been sort of like trying to think down that route a little bit. Um, but then athletically, the other thing is that I have really also been struggling with this idea of like, once I retire from triathlon, does that mean I just give up all of my athletic goals? What does that look like? Am I going to become a bump on a log? I just like, you know, I just don't know. And, and after doing a lot of thinking and I think again, kind of like going back to 2018 and 2019, like 2018, I was just so burned out. And then 2019, it reminded me of why I love tri triathlon and what I love about the process and everything. And that made me realize that as I go into the next stage of my career, I, it's okay to still have high performing athletic goals and still be, like moving on from being a professional triathlete. So I love running. I think that there's still a lot in me within running. So I've been, I'm, I'm thinking I'm probably going to try to like transition a little bit more into like the marathon and ultra running type scene. I'm like really intrigued by that. And then also I've been really loving um, riding my gravel bike. So I kind of want to transition a little bit into the gravel oh, scene this is like but... so classic bay area everyone's getting into ultra running and <laughs> gravel know. riding <laughs> I, know, I know i know i know but but not just ultra running i mean i i've kind of set this goal for myself to try to run under 230 in the marathon okay. which um i don't think is definitely i cannot do that right now well, i was I think like it's i was like didn't like a... you run like 245 or something 240... 246 okay. yeah so it's a big big goal i think this will be like a multi-year project okay. I'm not expecting to be running in the low two twenties. I don't expect to become a professional runner in any capacity, but I do think that with sort of a multi-year progression, that's something that I could strive towards. So I've kind of set some big goals for myself athletically. Um, some personal yeah, goals. Okay. The personal goals. Yeah. But God, I don't know. Going back into an uh, office is, it's like really hard to get my head around. I don't know. It's like, well, offices are so like 2019. I think we're all not in offices anymore, right? So I know the other perk of COVID <laughs> is that the work from home movement is coming back. <laughs> not coming back. It's coming into the limelight. Everybody can work from home. Now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It'll be fine. I, mean, I love setting my own hours and I feel like I work hard and I get my work done. So 
I don't know. Why do you have to go into an office to do that? You don't have to sell me. I'm sold. So. Your <laughs> husband also, I mean, he like, he's a chiropractor, right? So he has his yeah. own whole like business too. Which, by yeah, the way, does. it must be really nice to have a chiropractor in your quarantine at home right now. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I mean, I, I so normally pre-COVID, I had would get like a massage a couple times a week and then my husband would treat me. But if he wasn't able to treat me, it was fine because I was able to get these massages and get body work done. And now I haven't had a massage since COVID happened. So he is he, he's I'm a real treat for him right now. <laughs> Like, oh, <laughs> well, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I was going to ask you about upcoming plans. Obviously, like usually we would ask people what they're doing, what their schedule is, but it's so hard right now. You already have a Kona spot. So that's like at least sort of on your calendar, but who knows? I know you also were supposed to be in the elite field for the Boston Marathon, but again, True. who knows if that happens in September. Yeah. So just waiting yeah. to see right now, right? Yeah, waiting to see. And um you know, I, I actually ended up getting a stress fracture. So I have been off running for almost five weeks now. And I'm just, I'm bringing back the walk run right mm. now. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, same thing with Boston. It's like, I'm going right now with this expectation that it's just probably not going to happen, but um, just continuing on with what I can get done. And if they decide that Boston's going to happen, great. But I don't know. I, it's just, it's tough, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not banking on, on any of those things happening right now. <laughs> so we've been finishing lately with a, would you rather? And now I'm like, all your talk of this, I'm like, he, so here's my question for you. Would you rather, would you rather that like right now they said two weeks Kona is happening, you know, suddenly like a race was happening or that you knew, you know, in a year and we could guarantee it, which would you rather like right now or I would do Kona right now. Why not? <laughs> Why Imagine not? how epic that would be. <laughs> Nobody swam for like two months. People would be, I actually might make a pack in the swimming, <laughs> which would be incredible. So then, I don't know. I assume most people have been training on the trainer, but like, you know, on bike trainer. So people would probably be in pretty good bike fitness and probably decent run fitness. But it would be like, I feel like it would be, it would be quite a comedy because just, People are at very, all varying levels right now. It'd be like kind of epic. I'm down for two weeks. I actually think it'd be really fun. You know how Mavericks they like have a window and then they call it in the window. I think they yeah. should do that for triathlon. I think that'd be really fun. So <laughs> that would be really interesting, actually. Yeah. <laughs> really interesting. Well, thank you so much for talking to us, Sarah, and for you know all the the real talk about about how things are right now. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me on and. Hopefully other people bring you some real talk too. I like it. I actually have to say as a side, even though I know this is supposed to end, but I've gotten more responses from that What's Up uh, interview than any other podcast I've done. And I think that people really did appreciate me just being open and honest because I think that so much, so many times a lot of people just give this really rosy picture of the world and a lot of fluff. And sometimes it's important just to like, say how it is so oh yeah thanks for for having me on yeah thank you thanks to sarah and jordan and thanks to our triathlete staff and to all of you for listening like i mentioned at the top we will be launching a new podcast focused on training topics how to get you fitter and faster and the first episode will be coming later this week so subscribe on itunes stitcher iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcasts And in the meantime, keep training and keep listening.